I ended my first Art of Japan lecture with the Tokugawa shogunate, which ruled Japan from 1603 until 1868, when the power of the emperor was restored, it's called the Meiji Restoration, and Japan began its mad dash toward modernization. During these years, the shogunate maintained a monopoly over, and indeed imposed strict control over, all foreign trade. Both of our last two works were produced during this period, although the Great Wave shows how Japan's isolation was breaking down by the 1830s. The Tokugawa shogunate is also known as the Edo period because the shogun moved the capital to Edo, the city that today we call Tokyo. The once despised merchant class enjoyed a rise in social and economic status, and this growing affluence produced a new market for art. It also helped give rise to a culture more attuned to the common man. In my first Japanese art lecture, I shared an example of Tokugawa warrior art, the screen painting of the Battle of Sekigahara. Another form of Yamato-e, or indigenous painting, evolved during this period, and its most famous artist was Ogata Korin. In fact, he gave his name to the school. Rin is the second syllable of his name. Pa means school. So how would you contrast the Rinpa school work above with the Yamato-e works below? Obviously, the subject matter of white and red plum blossoms is much less warlike. The artist focuses on themes from nature. The composition is also much, much less crowded. It is simple and austere. Here you see two paintings by Ogata Korin, our required work, and another folding screen of irises along a bridge. While the subject matter, again, is very different from Night Attack on Sanjo Palace, these two very different Yamato A paintings do nevertheless have some qualities in common. And what, do you, what do you think these common qualities might be? Well, there's the bird's eye view viewpoint, for one. The paintings also employ vibrant colors. It is hard to tell with the plum blossoms since, as you read, the painting has faded considerably. Strong, repeated patterns create a sense of rhythm and help organize our viewing experience. Diagonal lines add drama even to subjects such as, as still and calming as these. But the Rimpa school tended to take its subjects from nature and the seasons, not history. Plum and cherry blossoms hold special significance in Japanese culture. They herald the end of a long, cold winter and the coming of spring, rebirth, and renewal. Korin developed a painting style that was more abstract and simplified than the compositions of his predecessors. He employed vivid colors on ink or ink monochrome, often on a gold background. Korin came from a family of wealthy textile merchants, and he used his decorative and bold designs on textiles, lacquerware, and ceramics, as well as paintings. His work was published in pattern books and manuals, and in this way he inspired many other craftsmen. Here are two examples of Korin patterns published in books. Note the simple shapes, the active brush strokes, the bright colors, the diagonal lines, and the nature themes. I could imagine these showing up as attribution works. And here is a kimono that Korin is said to have designed for the matron of a family who hosted him on visits to Edo, or today's Tokyo. Remember the spare Zen Buddhist aesthetic of these gardens? This seems much closer in spirit to our plum blossoms. Korin was not a religious painter. In fact, he was well known for being a wild living bad boy. But the Zen Buddhist aesthetic did influence Japanese nature painting. And I'd also note that many of the samurai were practitioners of Zen Buddhism. We've seen that some Yamato-e artists painted the military world of the samurai, while others, such as the Rinpa school, captured the natural world and followed the Zen Buddhist ideals of spare, simple design. But the rising merchant classes and the samurai warriors who no longer had wars to fight also gathered in social clubs to mingle, despite rules against breaching social class barriers, to read and write poetry, and to enjoy the services of courtesans and beautiful young female entertainers known as the geisha. These pursuits were captured in art of the so-called floating world. These woodblock prints were enormously popular and surprisingly cheap. A rising middle class could not afford elaborately painted silk screens, but they could afford reproductions made by artists who carved designs into woodblocks and then printed them with ink. The whole world of geishas, courtesans, tea houses, and kabuki theater is fascinating, and we don't have time to go there since these are not included in our required works. But the video link included here has a really interesting segment on this geisha and courtesan culture, and I think you'd enjoy it. The link is up on Canvas, and I've noted the times here.
Our final work is a woodblock print whose artist was heavily influenced by these artistic renderings of the floating world, and who also produced very popular woodblock prints. This is probably the best known Japanese work, at least in the West. And it remains an iconic image, used constantly in marketing ads and even cartoons. This one is my personal favorite. C is for cookie, that's good enough for me. I do have grandkids. But here I face a dilemma. And it's not just that we're short of time, although we, of course we always are. Even though Hakusai never traveled outside of Japan and probably never met anyone who wasn't Japanese, he was nevertheless deeply influenced by developments in European art, including materials such as oil paint and techniques such as linear perspective. His woodblock prints, in turn, would have a profound influence on the late 19th century painters, including the Impressionists. Trouble is, we're not there yet, so I'm going to return to this work in the spring. For now, let's watch a short video that describes what's happening in this scene. I'm going to close the disembodied voice portion of today's lesson by showing you a few more woodblock prints from this series. Think about the elements they have in common. Hakusai woodblock ink prints, note prints, not paintings, frequently show up as attribution questions on the AP Art History exam, as the AP Classroom questions should have persuaded you. So, we see that Prussian blue ink imported from Europe. We see strong use of lime, line, a rather flat pictorial space, and of course, the iconic Mount Fuji. Here is Mount Fuji again, and also we see people dwarfed by, maybe struggling against nature. I really hope you have time to watch these last segments of a very good video about the Great Wave. Start by watching the brief introductory segment, which makes somewhat different points than the art museum clip you just saw. But more importantly, I hope you have time to watch a four minute clip about the artist's production decisions, compositions, and technique and materials, especially the technique for making woodblock prints. And with this, we come to the end of Unit 7 and to the end of Semester 1. It has been a long, hard journey with, I hope, some enlightening and even joyous moments. Merry